Good morning. morning. Welcome to Mount Calvary on this Christmas morning, whether you are visiting with us as a member or whether you are worshiping in person or or online. Today's service is printed in the worship folder that you received upon entering church. Uh, Everything is there with the exception of the hymns. Uh, Please note for the opening hymn, we'll sing the first three verses and then after the confession and absolution, the final verse of the opening hymn, Now Sing We Now Rejoice. We'll begin our service then as we celebrate the fact that God became man in order to bring mankind to him by, with the ring of the bells and enjoined to sing our opening hymn, hymn number 363, the first three verses. this morning in the name of the Father who sent his Son, born of a woman, in the name of Jesus, whose birth we have come to celebrate, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, who opens our eyes to see Jesus as our Savior. We worship and give our praise. Almighty God, before whom angels veil their faces and in whose presence they delight, we come with reverence and joy to worship you. We acknowledge your glory and praise you for the salvation you have accomplished. Praise we the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the joy we share this Christmas day. Lord Jesus, born weak and humble in a stall, how unworthy we are to receive you. We confess that we need you, the Savior, Christ our Lord. Though we are covered with sin, In your grace, accept us, our gifts, and our praise. The Lord our God brings grace, mercy, and peace to us. By the birth of his Son, he reveals the Redeemer of all mankind. By what Jesus has accomplished, we have peace with God in heaven. He forgives us and accepts us for Jesus' sake. Please be seated for the final verse of the hymn.
Almighty God, grant that the birth of your only Son in the flesh may set us free from our old bondage under the yoke of sin. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Old Testament lesson this morning is taken from the prophet Micah, the fifth chapter, beginning with the second verse. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, from you will go out the one who will be the ruler for me in Israel. His goings forth are from the beginning, from the days of eternity. Therefore the Lord will give them up until the time when the woman who is in labor bears a child. Then the remaining survivors from his brothers will return to the people of Israel. He will stand and shepherd with the strength of the Lord. In the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, they will dwell securely, for at that time he will be great to the ends of the earth. This one will be their peace. This ends our Old Testament lesson. We sing our next hymn, hymn number 352. The epistle lesson is taken from the fourth chapter of Paul's letter to the Galatians, beginning with the fourth verse. But when the set time had fully come, 
God sent his son to be born of a woman, so that he would be born under the law, in order to redeem those under the law, so that we would be adopted as sons. And because you are sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts to shout, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you are a son, then you are also an heir of God through Christ. This ends the epistle lesson. This morning's anthem will be sung by the choir. Son 
Please stand for the reading of the Gospel. Christmas Gospel is taken from St. John in chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him everything was made, and without him not one thing was made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of mankind. The light is shining in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God, whose name was John. He came as an eyewitness to testify about the light so that everyone would believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. The real light that shines on everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. Yet the world did not recognize him. He came to what was his own, yet his own people did not accept him. But to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. They were born not of blood or of the desire of the flesh or of a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and dwelled among us. We have seen his glory, the glory he has as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him. He cried out, This was the one I spoke about when I said, The one coming after me outranks me, because he existed before me. For out of his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God. The only begotten Son, who is close to the Father's side, has made him known. This ends our Gospel lesson. Please be seated for our next hymn.
Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father, and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. For our meditation this Christmas morning, we turn our attention again to Paul's letter to the Galatians in chapter 4. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his Son to be born of a woman, so that he would be born under the law, in order to redeem those under the law, so that we would be adopted as sons. And if you are a son, then you are also an heir of God through Christ. The Word of God. Dear friends in Jesus Christ, our Lord, what Christmas means to me is a song that's been recorded by a number of artists over the years. And on the things that they list are mistletoe and candles burning low, snow and ice, and choirs singing nice, and other things that Christmas means to them. And of course, Christmas means a lot of things to a lot of people. For some, it's a time to celebrate and to travel. For others, it's a time to welcome people to their home. A time for giving gifts, a time for enjoying good food. It may vary from person to person, place to place. The various customs of Christmas are different all around the world. And yet, for each of us, Christmas has certain meaning, and probably the one universal meaning for every Christian, no matter where we live or at what time in world history we live, is that Christmas is a time to celebrate the birth of the Savior. What Christmas means is the question Paul answers in our text this morning. What Christmas means for Christ and what Christmas means for us. So let's find out. We celebrate Jesus' birth today, the 25th of December. It's been that date since about the mid-fourth century when it was decided by Christian leaders that it would be good to celebrate the birth of the Savior at a time of year that could kind of counteract a lot of pagan celebrations that were happening. With the winter solstice just a few days ago, that time of year was celebrated by pagans who were looking forward, as we all probably are on a typical year, to warmer weather and springtime, the opportunity to be outdoors and longer days. And so they had celebrations for the man-made deities of Saturn and Mithra. And it was thought that once the empire became Christian under Emperor Constantine, that wasn't good. So let's plunk the celebration of Jesus' birth right around that time. December the 25th was chosen. And it's been that way for a long time. And it's become a tradition. And if you're a Lutheran, you know that traditions are hard to break. <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us when Jesus was born. Some speculate it could have been actually in the springtime, but we don't know for sure. What the Bible does tell us, not the date of his birth, but it is very clear on the purpose of his birth and what Christmas meant for him. For Jesus, Christmas was a time to leave home and a time to get to work. And that work is what the Apostle Paul talks about in this brief reading. God had sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law with all of the obligation to keep God's law that every human has. And so he did. He did that in order to redeem, that is to buy back those who are under law, which is every man, woman, and child who's ever been born. Even though we maybe didn't know it from our parents, it wasn't told us by a doctor, it was not on our birth certificate, you and I are born under the moral obligation to obey God. But no human being has done that. We've all deviated in one way or another. Some going this way, some violating that law. Plus, we were all born with sin already coursing through our veins because we had a human mother and a human father. And so God sent his son, born of a woman, like all of us were, but without a human father. So there was no original sin in him. He started off with a clean slate. And he kept his slate clean throughout his entire lifetime. From the moment of his birth, right on through to his death. Now, when a child is born, mom and dad might begin to wonder what this little child will grow up to do. 
What wonderful things he or she might accomplish with their life using their skills in whatever area they feel is appropriate. As the child grows up, he or she begins to wonder themselves. And in grade school, they begin to imagine their life as a, a policeman or a fireman, a doctor, a lawyer. Maybe they want to be an astronaut. Maybe they want to travel. And so they begin to have these visions of their own future. And by the time we graduate high school, many young men and women already are pretty well set on their career path. They're going to do this or that. Those things may change, but they've got a pretty good idea. The Lord Jesus knew exactly what his career would be, knew what his purpose was. And he didn't wait till he turned 18 to begin it. And it was not learning the carpentry trade from his stepfather, Joseph, either. He knew that his purpose was to obey the law of God in order to buy us back from sin and death and hell. And so he began doing that right away. Even as a little tyke, he was perfect. That child never once threw a temper tantrum. Mary and Joseph did not live through the terrible twos with their first child or the terrible threes. He never acted as if he was jealous of his step-siblings when they got more attention than he did from Joseph or from Mary. He never came off to his parents and acted to them in disrespectful ways as if he knew it all. Even though, as the Son of God, he knew it all. As a teenage boy, he knew what girls were, but he did not lust after them. He was pure in his thoughts and his words, his actions. He was the perfect classmate in school. He was the perfect student. Never disruptive, turned his work in on time, all of those things. He was in every single facet perfect, not to draw attention to himself, not so that he could win praise while his family members and his classmates and his neighbors all seethed with jealousy. He was the perfect classmate and child and neighbor and person in our place. Because what God demands of us, God demanded of him. And what he delivered to God, God credits to us. So he was born under law for a specific purpose to redeem you and me who are under the law, along with all other people. So that we would not experience what our sins deserve and, and have to live eternally in the horror of hell, but rather get to share with him in the glory of heaven. Now, as we mentioned earlier, Christmas does mean different things to different people. For some, it's getting together with family. For others, it might be traveling. For some people, the idea of a perfect Christmas is just some quiet time. Maybe by a fireplace, with the candles on the tree, or the lights on the tree. For others, it might be the, the crowded family gathered together in the dining room with a little bit of chaos as everybody jostles for a seat at the table or for that best piece of the, the turkey or the Christmas goose. Or it's the, the clamor of the kids around the tree as they're searching for their present. And it's a delight to parents and grandparents alike if they can be there. For others, Christmas is a wonderful time when they could go outside and build a snowman or go skiing. For others, they enjoy the tropical Christmases that are part of their world. For us, in this part of the country, this seems like an unusual Christmas in terms of our weather. For many, this would be a Christmas present come true. Christmas is indeed something different to different people. For Christ, it meant it was time to get busy. For us, it means something completely different. Jesus was born under the law to redeem us so that we, Paul says, would receive all the rights of sonship. So that we would be counted part of God's family. And that's what we are. Sons and daughters of the Heavenly Father. Not because that's the family we were born into. We weren't. We were not only born into a different family. The family into which we were born actually didn't even like God. By nature, we didn't. We're born not as a child of God, not as one who loves God. Paul would later say in his letter that our natural condition is that we are God's enemy. We're not indifferent to him. 
We hate him. But God loves us. And so God has adopted us into his family. The day he brought you and me to faith and made us his son or his daughter, we became his beloved child. And we have been that beloved child ever since. And God is the perfect father. Even if we are not the perfect children. We've all seen the perfect family. If you haven't, just go on some YouTube site or something there like it and type in something like Father Knows Best or Leave It to Beaver or one of those old TV programs that depict the perfect family. There's mom and there's dad and there's the kids. And any conflict is resolved peaceably and amiably all within about 30 minutes or less if you take into consideration the commercials. And everybody gets along just wonderfully. We might think that's the perfect family. And of course, in our own families, we recognize those moments are, are treasured. But we also realize they may be few and far between because our families aren't perfect. Husbands and wives don't always see eye to eye. And it's not always the other person's fault. Children don't always get along with their parents. Parents don't always love their kids. And yet we are part of another family, the family of God. And we have him as our perfect heavenly father who lovingly forgives all of our sins. He doesn't ignore them. He doesn't pretend they don't exist. They're serious offenses, but he has removed them by his son who took them in our place. And so now we have all the rights of sonship, of being a member of the family of God. Paul contrasts sons not versus daughters, but sons versus slaves who had no rights at all. They were simply property in those days, as they always are. But as a son, as a member of the family, you have privileges. And we enjoy some of those privileges now. You and I have the privilege, as a child of God, to talk to our Heavenly Father anytime we want. He's never too busy. He's never on the line with someone else and can't listen to us. And our concerns are never too big nor too small for him to want to listen. He may not answer our prayers the way we think we'd like him to, when we'd like him to, but he always hears and he always answers in the way that is best for us. We as his children enjoy peace of mind that we know that all of our sins are forgiven, erased and gone. And our future ones, likewise, are not going to be held against them. God is not waiting to punish you or me for our missteps and our transgressions. When something bad happens to us, God is not punishing us for what we did last week, last month, 25 years ago. God punished Jesus for our sins. He will not, he cannot punish us for our sins because he's put them already upon his son. He loves his children too much for that. He forgives us freely and fully. And that's just the start. Paul also reminds us that as sons, we are also heirs of an eternity with God in heaven. It's Christmas, so we've given gifts. We've received gifts. Maybe you opened yours last night. Maybe you opened them early this morning. Maybe you're waiting till this service ends, and you're going to open them after church doesn't really matter when a person opens their gifts. But we're excited. We get things perhaps we totally unexpected by, the, by that particular gift. Maybe it was something we thought we were going to get. The shape of the package kind of gave it away. But sometimes you get those gifts and, and you can see it as a child tears open their present. And it's that electronic thing they've been hoping and praying for. It's the coolest gadget to come along. Everybody in their school is getting it. And they tear it open and they're delighted and they scream and they hug mom and they hug dad. And then they read those three little words on the box. Batteries not included. <laughs> dad, dad, hero of the night or day, heads to the place where the batteries are kept. Finds the appropriate size. How many are needed, son? Four. We have three. It's Christmas Eve. We live in a place that doesn't have one of those all-night stores open on Christmas Eve. Hopefully none of them are on Christmas Eve or Christmas Day. The stores are closed, as they should be. And we can't get that fourth battery, son. 
daughter, you're going to have to wait to play with this toy. <laughs> It'd be better if I didn't have it. <laughs> and the child has to wait. But it's not just kids. Let's be honest, it's not just children. Older kids, too, they get a brand new bicycle. They've outgrown the old one. It's not in good shape anyway. But it's a typical Midwestern winter. Cold, snow and ice. A bike is wonderful in April, May, right on through October. Not so much so around a typical Christmas. Well, I'll take it downstairs and ride around in the basement. <laughs> that doesn't last for a very long in terms of excitement. Now, I'm going to buy Mom, going together with Dad to get this one. We bought Mom a whole new set of golf clubs. Mom loves to golf. She needs a new set. <laughs> Here you go, Mom. You can use them in a few months, we hope. Unless you go to one of those golf places that might have an indoor simulator driving range. Dad, we got you a perfect, we got a fish finder for Dad. You put it on his boat, this thing finds fish, it tells you the depth, lets you know what the bottom of the lake topography looks like. This thing does everything but bait the hook and put the fish in a boat. But Dad's boat is in storage. And this can't be used for several months and Dad doesn't ice fish, so it's going to sit there for a while. You and I are sons and daughters of our Heavenly Father. We are heirs of eternal life in heaven. We're not there yet, but we're waiting. We have a gift from God that we haven't been able to open yet, or you might say put to full use, because we don't know the glories of heaven that await us. But they are there. That is our situation. That's what Christmas means for us. We get gifts now. Prayer, peace of mind, and many others the forgiveness of our sins, and the promise of eternal life, that inheritance with God in heaven, but we're not there. We wait for it. Sometimes we maybe think we hope it doesn't come too soon, because there's things we'd like to do here. We mourn when a loved one goes there before us, even though I suppose we should rejoice. They're now with their Savior, and they're now in paradise. We ourselves look forward to seeing them again at the great reunion of all the saints, or when we ourselves are taken, if that comes first. And that's the true meaning of Christmas for us, is that we have this wonderful gift given to us by God, not just of the baby in Bethlehem, but of all the things that come with him, chief among them eternal life in paradise. And a better gift you will not find on the internet, in your local store, the big box, or small businesses. The gift that God gives you is his son and eternal life through him as his child. So whatever Christmas means for you as an individual or for your family, whatever customs and traditions you observe, I hope they all went or will go well and smooth. If you have travel plans, I hope you have safe travel to and from your destinations. But Christmas means so much more for us as God's children. It means that we will not only celebrate his birth here on earth every year that it rolls around, but that we will be able to celebrate with him forever in the glory of heaven because what Christmas meant for him means that Christmas means for us eternal life in glory. Amen. Please rise. We join now in confessing our faith with the confession printed in our worship folder. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who promised a Savior, and who at the proper time sent his Son to be my Savior. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, my Lord, whose birth was foretold by the prophets, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, announced by the angels, worshipped by the shepherds, adored by the wise men, who lived, suffered, died, and rose again to free me from the guilt of my sin, the fear of death, and the power of the devil. I believe in the Holy Spirit, who by my baptism brought me to faith, to see the baby of Bethlehem as my Savior, and by whose continuous work in my heart I rejoice at his birth, which brings me salvation, 
declare his praise in my life and will one day live and reign with him in all eternity. Please remain standing as the offering is brought forward. Keep us yours forever, O Christ, child sweet and dear. Uphold us with your mercy and remain forever near. From you we gladly all receive, and what is ours to you we give. Our hearts, our souls, and all we own. Let these be yours alone. Amen. Eternal and gracious Lord, on this holy day we rejoice with hearts and voices because you sent your one and only Son from his majestic glory to save us from the slavery of sin and the agonies of death. He took on our human flesh that he might reveal your divine glory. He became our brother that we might become your children forever. Give us quiet time during these busy days to reflect upon your love and to ponder the miracle of our Savior's incarnation. Help us look beyond our gift-giving and gift-receiving and discover the greatest gift, the forgiveness of sins and life with you. Put the joys of Christmas into the perspective of our eternal celebration, and let music and art lift our hearts to Christ, who is truly the center of the season. Keep in your loving care all whose Christmas joys are diminished by sickness or sadness, by unhappy recollections and uncertain hopes. Comfort those who sense this Christmas may be their last, and raise their eyes to the brilliant lights of heaven. Soothe the consciences that are troubled by guilt and regret, and show them the forgiving love of Christ. We commend to your care all who proclaim the message of Christ during these holy days, all who care for people in hospitals, nursing homes, and prisons, and all who put themselves out to bring joy to others, especially children. Let the light of your grace shine through all ministries of mercy. Send us your Holy Spirit, gracious Lord, <clears throat> that the proclamation of the, Christ, of the Christmas gospel may lighten the load of guilt and fear and lift our hearts to confident faith and holy living. By the power of your word, bring your light to hearts struggling to understand you and searching to find you, that they may know the joys of this season as we do. Empower us to lead them to your love in our words and our actions. All this we ask in the name of the newborn King, born in Bethlehem, and now living and reigning forever in heaven. Amen. And we join to pray the prayer which our Lord has taught us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn, hymn number 342.
Please rise for the responsive Christmas litany. Praise, honor, and glory be to you, our Savior King. In your wondrous love, you humbled yourself and were born a child. Praise to you that you humbled yourself and became obedient to death. We know that the manger was but the first step on the way to the cross. You came to fulfill God's plan of salvation. We praise you for sharing the blessed knowledge of salvation with us. Keep us all in your family of believers so that we may serve you here and enjoy peace and rest in heaven. Help us to be like the shepherds at Bethlehem who left all to worship you and shared the news of your birth. Help us to be like the wise men who worshiped you and brought you their gifts. Allow us to be like the angels and with the angels who praise you now and forever in heaven. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for the closing hymn, hymn 353.
Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you to the choir, to their director and accompanist, to our videographers, to our usher for their work in beautifying our service this morning. Thank you also to the families of our congregation who donated poinsettias that have beautified our church uh, the last couple of days. If you would like to take yours home with you today, you're welcome to do so. There are some bags up here to protect them from what should be the cold weather, um, but those bags are located under the table up here. Uh, if you do not take yours, we will try to keep them looking as nice as we can throughout the week uh, so that they can, of course, be here for our service next Sunday, which will be our New Year's Eve worship service, but it will take place at 9 o'clock in the morning. Uh, there will be no evening service next Sunday. Uh, also, as you leave today, please, uh, members, check your church mailboxes. Again, um, people have been putting cards in there, uh, Christmas cards, uh, thank yous perhaps, a little Christmas gift. So uh, please check yours before you leave this morning. Also in the school hallway is a cooler with a lot of milk in it, some white milk, some chocolate milk. So you're welcome to take that. Uh, it won't be usable for the school by the time the kids get back into classes uh, next year. Uh, also, you have, if you've not yet picked up your offering envelopes for 2024, you're welcome to do that. They're in the back of the church. Uh, on the little table in the back uh, by the Christmas tree, our list of items that the school has, some projects they're looking to do along with the church um, in the coming months, years, as, as money allows. If you would like to contribute to that, you're welcome to do so. The sheets are on the table there. Again, we thank you for your time with us this morning. We look forward to worshiping with you again and wish you all a very merry and blessed Christmas. <laughs>